Okay, all right, so let's get started. Um, I'm here to talk about how to use our campus as a classroom for various courses. Um, and I don't want to make this terribly formal, but I just have a few comments about um, how I incorporated the campus into some of my courses, specifically um, the History 101, History 100, and the Honors 140 class. Um, I have to say that of the History 100 and History 101, it was the first choice class. So it's, it's already small, it's 19 students max. The Honors 140 class I taught last spring had, I believe it was um, nine students. Right. So it was very, very small. Um, and I'm planning to do the same project for my Honors 140 class this semester, but I only have six students. So it'll, I have to rethink how I'm going to do this project. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. For all those classes, do you pr predominantly have first year students, or is it? They're all first year students. Okay. They're all freshmen. Just like kind of provide a little. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's a good question because um, one of the reasons I want to incorporate the campus as, a, as part of these classes is because I think it encourages learning, obviously. Um, it gets our students, particularly our first year students, to visit some sites they ordinarily would not have a chance to visit because they're new to campus. And I think a lot of them are totally overwhelmed with all much, so much stuff they have to learn about the computers and the classes and the dining hall and the laundry and all this other stuff um, that they don't often have a chance to really explore the campus that much. Plus, I think they get so set in going to their classes that they don't really go out beyond uh, their comfort zone in that first year. Um, the other reason I've done this is because I think it develops a much deeper bond between the students and the campus. And because ultimately what we're, we're not just teaching them, we're also creating students um, and future alums who will, who really will find this place um, very warm, very welcoming, we hope, uh, a place where they can feel included, where they feel like they can always come back. One of the things I always tell my freshmen, and I'm sure you do too, is once you graduate from SUNY Oswego, we never let you go. You will always be a SUNY Oswego graduate. You'll always be an alum. You'll we'll always keep in contact with you at any point in your life. You can come back and use career development. You can talk to your professors. You can use the campus. You can come to the library. Um, you have you always have a home here, which I think for a lot of freshmen is really nice for them to hear. Um, and I think it, it builds a good um, camaraderie between the students themselves, and this really has a nice bonding effect between freshmen, which is really great, which is exactly what I think the first choice class should be doing, and exactly what the Honors 140 class should be doing. It also encourages them to go outside of their comfort zone, um, particularly for the honor students. So the honor students, I think, are really intelligent, they're very bright, they tend to do really well on papers and exams. They're very book smart, but they don't often want to go outside their comfort zone, and they don't want to press themselves or challenge themselves. So this assign assignments I do for these courses, I think, are really great to get them to uh, go outside their comfort zone. So um, the other reason I'm doing this is to uh, incorporate um, Oswego and how us, the history of Oswego fits into the larger framework of history. Um, because I, I am a historian and I do teach in the history department. Um, so for the first choice class, um, and Holly, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, for History 100, um, I incorporated um, this class to use special collections in Penfield, which is right downstairs. Um, and I do this on the Monday before Thanksgiving break. Um, and I think this is a really good use of time um, because I teach Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and fall. This is when I have the first choice class. Um, and that Monday before Thanksgiving break, a lot of students really don't want to do anything. They're tired. They've been overwhelmed. Um, this gives them a chance to learn a little bit more about the printing press, because the theme of the class is the printing press. History 100, just to give some context, goes from the beginning to 1500. So the printing press is around the 1550s. Um, so I have them read a brief article about the history of the printing press. I bring in some 16th century books that I own, and then we go to special collections, and they get to see early printed books in that collection, which is really cool. Um, I, I'm crazy about the printing press. Ask any of my students. I totally love the printing press, and any way I can include the printing press in my classes, I do. I love the printing press too. We should do something. You know? <laughs> right. So special collections is great because it's small. 
Um, and it's um, these special collections librarians have been really great about sharing lots of things with our students, which I think is great. It gets them downstairs, it gets them to see special collections, and when they see the printed books, early printed books, which are usually 16th and 17th century books that are in our collection, they also have a chance to look at other stuff. So they get to see the desk where Sheldon got to sit. They get to see the first grade book of SUNY As We Go from its inception, which is great to see. Um, they get to, um, if they're lucky, they get to see the death mats yeah, I've seen that. of Sheldon, which is really cool, kind of freaks them out. Um, but that's okay, because I want them to, be, to have their emotions stirred up and to see things differently. Because, and this is kind of special information. I'm not going to ordinarily get to see this kind of stuff in a regular course. Have you taken that same class over to printmaking to use, like, to, to see the letterpress working? I should. You should totally talk to Kelly Rowe about yep. it. It's all, it's all set up again. Back Good. In I should totally take them there because I think that would be a great compliment to seeing the books and seeing how they're actually printed. Yeah. That would be great. I would love that. So for the History 101, which I think is 1500 to, uh, to 1900, um, I, what I started actually doing um, staking the students to special collections when I was teaching History 101. Um, it's a little bit easier to incorporate history, more recent history into um, this course and into using our campus because um, obviously we're an institution that was founded in the 19th century, so it's a little bit easier. Uh, for this course, um, again, it was a first choice class. I had 19 students. Um, I utilized the Monday before Thanksgiving break, which was great to get them to do something. And the theme of that class for one on one was the modernization and westernization. So this needs a little bit of context. <clears throat> and here is um, the SUNY Oswego Alumni Magazine, which I use in this course, because it tells, this is a particular article about um, a graduate of SUNY Oswego. His name is Hideo Takamine. He graduated in 1877, so very, very soon, and very early in the history of SUNY Oswego. Um, there's actually a street named after Takamine. I was very glad to see this really quick street sign back up. So, so Takamine and Sheldon intersect. It's right. Takamine is right behind Sheldon Hall. So you can, if you want, I want to encourage students to go there and actually look at it so they can see, you know, and wonder, oh, I wonder who Takamine was. Well, now yeah, we know. So he was the son of a samurai. <coughs> um, he was one of a number of Japanese students who came to the United States in the 1870s specifically to learn um, modern Western American educational methods. And because we were a normal school, which promoted the Pestalozzi method, which is a much more interactive kind of educational system, which was relatively um, a radical kind of educational program um, for students at that time. I think this kind of lesson, using this kind of documentation, actually would be really great for the education program to have them see what was going on in the 1870s, because this is really something that we're very well known for. So as um, so I use this the special collection here to look at some letters between Takamine um, and one of his favorite teachers, Krusey, Herman Krusey, who was a professor here in the 1870s. Which is a war award named after. <coughs> You were right. Yep, there is. Um, and he came here with funding from the Japanese government because in the 1850s, 1860s, and 1870s, Japan was um, modernizing very rapidly. Um, it was it wanted to westernize very rapidly. It was also imperializing. So this fits into the larger framework of imperialization in the 19th century, which is what I focus on in 101. Um, and of course, I, I want to focus on Japan because we focus so much on Europe and the United States and imperializing powers in the 19th century that using Japan provides a different perspective on imperialism. Um, and they do imperialize, they go into China, they go into Korea and others. Um, so I take um, these, <coughs> I take students, um, we split them up into two groups. One group stays up here actually in this classroom, classroom number two. Um, and I give them a brief lecture about imperialism um, and modernization and westernization in Japan in the mid uh, to later 19th century. Um, I give them uh, photocopy transcripts of a letter between Takamine, his, his uh, legal professor, and Krusey, and we actually they actually have to transcribe a letter. 
Um, and it's very, it's not terribly exciting letter. It tends to be, students think it's kind of boring because not much happens. I'm on a boat, I'm going back home to Japan, I really miss you, I had a great time in Oswego. Nothing major, but that's the stuff of history. That's exactly what historians do. We read tons and tons of documents, we transcribe lots of documents, and we might find one or two bits of information in a letter that's relevant. Can I ask a question about that? Sure. I did a transcription project actually in my web class using the special collection. Oh, great. But I had a lot of trouble because my students couldn't read script. Yes. I the students can't read script. Yep. So one of the yeah, so one of the first that's a very good point. <laughs> um, and one of the things I do with them is the first thing we do before we actually transcribe the letter, because they don't have enough time to something they can in class. They only they transcribe in groups. <clears throat> I have them create the alphabet first. And I said, take a piece of paper, read the first line, and say, okay, how does Takamito write A? <coughs> how does he write B? <coughs> how does he write C? How does he write D? Both capital and lowercase. And once you have that alphabet, you can then go back cool. and yeah. figure out how you do it. And that's exactly the way I learned paleography to do mm -hmm. medieval history. Um, he is apparently, um, according to our early, earliest grade book that we have down in special collections, which is the DC. He was a terrible speller. <laughs> he failed spelling. Um, but no one heard that, right? Um, <coughs> um, and his grammar is kind of funky because he is, of course, a Japanese student learning English. Um, but it's really, I think, great for students to read these letters, um, to see what historians do, to really get into the nitty-gritty of what historians do, get to see um, our collection down in special collections. And then have what the nice thing about this, which a lot of students respond to when I ask them in their evaluations, is now they have a connection to this larger history. Sumi Asuigo has is now part of the imperialism project of Japan. Right? It's part of this new educational method. Um, although Japan doesn't adopt this particular pestilency method, um, Takamine goes back to Japan. He starts the Tokyo Normal School, which is now the Kubo University which Asuigo still has connections with, and we still are in communication with, I believe, his grandniece or great grandniece, who still sends us information. We have students who sometimes go there and study there. Um, and I think it's great for students, again, to have that sense of community, that sense of their history behind Sumi Asuigo, that they can utilize the space, that they can utilize the materials down in special collections, and have a real connection to this university that really does play a larger role in world history, which I think is really cool. <coughs> um, so there's Takamine. That was a, a photo taken when he was at a, a student here in the last week. So it's kind of interesting. Um, <coughs> How do students respond to that? Hmm? How do students respond to that? Um, they actually find it really interesting. I think they're surprised because I don't think they often think that their university has a history. And that it makes a difference. They think, oh, it's just, I'm just here, I'm just taking classes. You no, know, it has a history, it has a long history. And we may be, you know, one of many, many, many thousands of schools in the United States, but we now have this new connection with Japan that they didn't know about. Um, and I think, particularly for first year students, I think one of the things I like about it was is that they somehow had insider knowledge about their school. <laughs> yeah, <that's cool. laughs> that other people don't know about. It. So I find a lot of students they go they go back to their mates and their friends and go, oh guess what I saw my special collection. I do know what that is. And I get to see the death mask with Sheldon and I get to see the grave book of Sheldon. I get to see how much money Sheldon made, which apparently was a lot more than the professors did. No surprise. So I think they have a they have a special connection to this place that other students may not have. Um, and again, for me that's Learning is not just about sitting in a classroom taking notes. It's about learning about yourself. It's learning about your community. It's bonding with other students. It's bonding with your university. And I really hope that in 20 years, when we come back for reunions, they'll say, "Oh, remember that class we had when we got to see the death mask for Shelf? That was so cool." That's what I'm hoping for. And if they can just have that one bit of information that sort of clicks with them, if it inspires them, if it makes them excited, if it makes them Grosses them out if it something, some kind of visceral emotion. I think that's great. I think that's, you know, if they don't remember imperialism in Japan, okay. But if they remember that our university had something to do with Japan in some larger way, that's that's really cool because we're all interconnected. Okay. 
<laughs> so the other class, which is um, much more involved and actually does involve moving around campus, um, was for my honors 140 class. I did this in the spring. Um, my theme of my class was travel. Um, so I love travel myself, as you know. <laughs> so I really wanted to focus on how people learn through travel, <clears throat> um, how they learn not about not only about other cultures and other people, but how they learn about themselves. Because we often learn a lot about ourselves when we travel. Um, and they're different kinds of travel. So I think for a first year um, honors class, this is a great way for students to learn more about the world around them and learn something about themselves. And in my own sneaky way, it's also encouraging them to perhaps travel, right? To get outside their comfort zone and to explore the campus a little bit and explore the world. So we, ex we um, examine travel narratives from ancient Greek period to the 19th century. We usually finish with um, the interesting narrative of Olada Equiano, who was an enslaved African who came um, to who went to England. He eventually was free, and then he writes this beautiful autobiography of his, of his story. Um, and it's it's 18th century, I should say that's 18th century, but um, it's a really remarkable, remarkable book, and you can read it in various ways. So um, I really want them to delve deeply into these ideas about. So um, because um, I decided last year to have this pilgrimage assignment, um, partly because I think it's a way for them to explore the campus, to learn about things about the campus that they otherwise wouldn't know about. Um, the other reason is because we just got a new faculty member, Candace um, Hock, who is an expert on Southeast Asian Indian pilgrimage. So I thought, what better way to use a new person and to ask for her help so she gave a lecture about pilgrimage to my students, which was great, um, and talked about pilgrimage. They had they did an article, they read an article about it, we had a discussion about pilgrimage. We had um, a very good discussion about the different kinds of pilgrimages. It doesn't always have to be religious. People have pilgrimages to baseball games, right? They visit all the baseball stadiums in the country. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a religious kind of pilgrimage. Um, to prepare, so they students had to create their own pilgrimage using the ideas we learned about travel and pilgrimage in class. Um, and again, this is my way of encouraging honor students to really create the assignment themselves, spread their wings a little bit, go outside their comfort zone, um, and to do something a little bit different that they ordinarily would not do in a class. They're very good book learners, they're really good at you know, assignments and papers and exams, but when I gave them this assignment, I said, it's up to you. You have to create this, you have to figure out a theme, you have to decide where to go, you have to figure out its significance. You have to do the work. You've got to figure it out. And I did it as a group project. Um, so to prepare them for this, I created my own mini pilgrimage. I wanted to go out into the city, but the weather prevented me from doing so. So we stepped to campus, and I used various buildings <laughs> as the sites. Yeah, the weather's I was writing his last sentence on that. <laughs> We saw the basement. <laughs> right. Oh, I was wondering. Yeah. So I created my own mini pilgrimage using various buildings as a site. I focused on two themes for this. One, buildings that were named after a donor or a faculty member or a, uh, an alum who gave money. Um, I didn't make it all the way to Shinnaman because I teach in Mahar. I thought I would stick to Mahar, and do Mahar, Kendall, and Lanigan. Um, the other theme of my mini pilgrimage was an unusual place within these buildings that students may not have seen before. So in Mahara, we went to the basement, which I have to say is a kind of scary place. Um, and there's actually a very interesting sculpture slash musical instrument slash object that's in the hallway going downstairs in Mahara. Do you know that? No, I'm going to check that. Um, I'll have to make a It looks place. very Asian. <laughs> and we couldn't figure out. I took a picture of it, and no one seems to know what it is, what it's doing. I bet you Mike knows. Who? Mike playing it? He might know. Because it's probably part of the um, the Tyler collection. It might be. I don't know why it's there. If it's an artwork of It's You walk down the stairs, and then it's on the wall, and you would not ever see it. There's no tag. There's hmm. nothing. I don't I'll know have why to ask about it. I have no idea. Um, so we visited Mahar. We saw the basement. We got lost in Lanigan. <laughs> it's just up by. <laughs> a lot of students had never visited the basin of Mahar. Apparently, there's like a little pathway between Tyler and Mahar, which is really cool. So, two months later, I was able to do that. Um, 
And Lanigan, they had never seen the first bullet of Lanigan, so they wandered around Lanigan. And then, of course, we went to Penfield and we happened to find special collections open, so we went to special collections. And then we went into the um, actual room where they hold all this stuff. Um, and that's where the, um, well, I can explain that really about what we saw. So I created this mini pilgrimage to give them a sense of what they could do um, and how they might structure their own pilgrimage to have some kind of theme, some kind of a purpose. You can't just wander around and say, well, I want to around. It's got to have some kind of purpose. There has to be a liminal state between each site where you're sort of transitioning between this site and the other site. You're transitioning emotionally, physically. Um, uh, Candace also suggested that the students um, have, have some kind of um, connection with a natural site, something that's nature related, um, so that they have a, a connection between the built sites and the natural sites on campus. So some people you know, actually went in and took their shoes off and walked in the lake. Some people touched a tree, some people ticked up a rock, you know, they, they did different things to incorporate the natural uh, assignments. So they did their own pilgrimages, they took videos, they took photos, and they presented these, um, the, the results of their pilgrimage to the class. Then they had to write individual papers afterwards, assessing their pilgrimage, not only uh, from the perspective of a pilgrim, then actually traveling to each site, and then also as a scholar, so from a, an objective perspective of what they were. And they actually did a really good job of separating themselves as the pilgrim or as the scholar. And since we had a lot of readings to do in class about pilgrimage and about travel, they were really able to separate those two, um, and particularly for first year students, uh, to get some kind of perspective and, and take a step back and to sort of explore it from the perspective of someone who's observing it is really hard for them. But they did a good job. They did a really good job. So they had three, we had three groups, um, and the themes of the three groups were as follows. One group decided to focus on creation, so creating art, creating music, creating a scholarship. I spelled scholarship on the wrong. Um, so some people went to Tyler, they went to um, <coughs> they went to Penfield, they went to Hewitt, they visited various places, they visited dance studios and music studios, um, they visited uh, various sites on campus, which was really cool. They did a good job. Um, one other group decided to do a riff on my mini pilgrimage, which was fine. It was okay. They did a good job um, to sort of build. And they did, I said, well, if you're going to do that, you have to go to different places. So they went to Park and they went to Shimon and they went to Shelby. Right? They did all these places. The last group did a really interesting project where they decided that they would look at other classrooms and other buildings that were labeled. 119. We were in 119 in Mahar. So they said, what else is, what are the other 119 classrooms in the building in the, on the campus? And what are they doing when we're in our class? Because we don't know what they're doing. Um, and the first two themes were successful. They did a good job. And they were totally fine. The last theme actually was a complete failure. But they learned the most. So this is where I think this, I want to do this project again this semester because um, the pilgrimage one where they sort of went to different classroom 119 was unsuccessful in the sense there were no other rooms 119 in academic buildings used as classroom space. One was a bathroom, one was a men's room, one was a women's room, one was a room that held china and a grill apparently. Um, one didn't even exist. There was no 119. Oh, that's mysterious. Isn't that weird? <laughs> when they redid, when they redid um, the campus center and um, the campus center, they eliminated room 119. So it goes from 118 to 120, which is really weird. So they found out that of all the campus academic buildings that they visited on campus, Mahar was the only one that has a room 119 used as classroom which was really interesting. So, it, so ultimately, their pilgrimage was not successful. But on the other hand, they, it prompted them to think differently about how they're going to present this. And it prompted them to think about how pilgrimage can help them to understand the space that we're in, how they connect to that space, 
Um, and they had to rethink on their feet very quickly about how they're going to present this because it didn't work out. And as you both know, you know, if, if students often learn more from their failures than they do from their successes. So the failure actually turned out to be the most successful of like, yeah. What a great like, lesson on assumptions. I know. <laughs> it is. It was great. So um, the assignment ultimately enabled students to develop a new perspective on the school, its campus setting. In turn, they learned more about the relationship to the campus and the relationship between each other because they had to help each other out. And <clears throat> I had some responses to the assignment because they wrote a paper, they wrote this assessment. So I took some quotes out. Um, just to sort of give you a sense of how students responded to the assignment because I wanted them, um, I want to see what, what they learned from it. And I think it was different in the presentation in class than it was on paper. I think they could, because they all had to write individual papers. So one of the students who did the 119 program said, during our program, something, something my group and I noticed was how much power the title of honor students had. So they recognized their privilege as honor students. Each time we met staff members and asked for assistance because they had to go around and say, where's group 119? And all these staff people are like, why are you looking for 119? What's going on? And as soon as they mentioned my name, they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> that she would do something like that. Um, they introduced themselves as honor students, what their project was, what the class was. And from the moment we said the word honors, they perceived us um, and seemed to put their full trust in the fact that we were telling the truth. And this relates to the idea of exceptionalism, which is the idea that because one is so unique and exceptional, they do not have to follow the same rules as everyone else. For honor students, it's assumed that we can trust you. Um, and this begs the question if any student, anyone came onto campus and claimed they were doing something beyond the program, would they assume that they were true? So they're questioning their, their privilege. One of the people, they went to the campus center and Barb, do you know Barb in the campus center? Um, Barb let them into the hockey room. And she's like, oh, do you want to go see the hockey game? I said, sure. I said, okay. So she let them in and let them wander around by themselves for like 20 minutes because she was unique. And then she said, just close the door when you're done. And they could have done anything. They recognized that they were really privileged to have access to that students because of their status as others, which was really interesting for them to see that they, they understood their privilege. Um, one other student said they experienced a sense of communitas or community as we traveled around campus, so they developed a bond with each other, which was really good to see. So the pilgrimage, you know, enabled them to see connections between themselves that they hadn't seen before. And one student actually said, you know, when we come back from the unions, we're going to remember those. Like, well, this is going to be a bond reunion. We're going to have a special connection between these guys, which I thought was really cool. Um, another student noticed that they used their sense of sight, touch, smell, taste, and hearing because they had to be so highly observant of where they were going and they had to take different routes. Um, and of course, for me as, a, you know, as an educator, for them to have used all of their senses for their learning is fantastic. That's exactly what we want to see. We want them to engage every single thing. Um, they bonded with new people. Um, and one of their students noticed the liminal moments between when they were walking between buildings because I instructed them, I said, don't take the usual route you take from say Shimon to Duhar. Take a different route that forces you to think about how you're getting there and think about why you're taking that route. But don't take the normal route you usually do because this is not the normal space. This is not the normal kind of activity. So they noticed the liminal moments are when you separate, have your time to reflect, you assimilate back with the group. To me, I define these moments as my learning moments because it's a good time for me to reflect on what we learned in the previous building, get to know about what might happen next, and then go back and talk to my group about my thoughts if I need to. So the whole project overall, I think, was very successful. And I'm doing it again this, um, this uh, semester. So I'm really curious to see what this group is going to do and how they're going to respond to it. Um, my plan for this semester, however, is going to be a little different <clears throat> in that I think I want each group to create a pilgrimage, but then the other group has to do the pilgrimage they create. So instead of doing your own pilgrimage where they create one and then they do their own pilgrimage, I'm going to say, now you're creating for that group. So don't tell them the theme, don't tell them the ultimate goal. They let them figure it out and see what the two can do. Um, and that requires that the group actually have a little bit more investment in teaching 
and instructing other groups about how they should go about it. Um, so I'm hoping that will then um, get them to have a little bit more distance and a little bit more project. But I would encourage any of you to think of, if you're thinking about using the, the campus as a classroom, um, there are so many really cool things about the, the history of this campus, which is really cool. Even just looking at street signs, which I do all the time now because it happens in the world, I'm always very curious. Like, why is this street called Skyler Street? Um, Sheldon, I get, but what other? What are the other names of the street? Why are they there? What is that? Have? What connection does that have? What kind of? You know, how do, how do we connect with the history of our collection? So we can utilize, um, get our students to to get outside the classroom setting and, and do a little bit of exploring. So, and that's that. Any questions? Holly, do you have any questions? There's someone else there too? Yeah. Oh, a little bit. Do you have any questions? Yeah, you know, this is very timely for something that I'm working on. Oh, yeah? What is that? <laughs> this is for my travel class. Uh -huh. Especially like your little pilgrimage is very similar to an assignment that I have. Uh -huh. Yep, trying to like refine a little bit. Okay. You know, before next week. Um, <laughs> what a pick your brain while I have to. Uh, sure. <laughs> Do you, um, want, do you want this? My outline? Yeah, that would be really great. Okay. I can give you the pill, I can send you the pilgrimage assignment that I have. Yeah, that's really cool. It's related to so the assignment that I want them to do is is about wayfinding. Oh. Um, so it's related to what you did in that like want them to go to a building they've never been to, go to a place in that building they've never been to, but to rely only on like signage that exists in the building or talking to people. They can't oh. use their device at all. Wow. Oh boy, that's good. Because like that's the that. same kind of thing that happens often when you're traveling. Yeah. Especially if you're traveling abroad and maybe you don't have Wi Fi or right. Like, you're used to your phone and now you don't have it. Like, how do you, how do you, how do you negotiate that? Yeah. yeah. And how do you feel as you're doing that? Yeah. 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 Exactly. The anxiety that might be there or whatever. Right. And um, how you overcome that. But I'm trying to come up with a couple of like really interesting places to send them to. So I want them to have a specific destination they have to go to that they're right. definitely not been to. to. Yeah, um, and most of our students are either anthropology students or design students. Okay. So I want to send them like the other side of the like, <laughs> <laughs> Um So if anyone has any good ideas about like where to go, that would be really interesting mm -hmm. um, to, as something to send them. But like it's kind of the same idea. It's like how did you navigate? How did you know where to find stuff? Right. Like, like, how did you feel? Like, how did you feel about it? How did you how did you negotiate? Um, if you couldn't ask anybody, or sometimes showing is completely empty. Yeah. And I would encourage your students to go at different times, not just go at one time where they can just simply ask people where to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. But go at times when Shimmy is empty. Yeah. And the cafe is closed, and then they have to have, they have to do a little bit more of the work themselves. So yeah. um, that might be a good way to encourage them to use the signage and to or just encourage them to get talk to people. To just just, just wander around. And, and if you can't find it, you can't find it. Really. You can't find it. But then I would also encourage them to have um, um, a list of places they have to go to in Shinmu. Just wandering around aimlessly is not going to Yeah, that's why I want like specific locations. Like, a lot of the planetarium is a place. That would be good. <coughs> but I, you know, I was curious yeah. if anybody else had any interesting locations. There's also like in, the, in Wilbur, there's a new um, like meditation reflection space. Like, so there, like, it's unlikely that they've been there. Right. I was trying to come up with some interesting places. Yeah, the, but there's probably tons of places that I don't know of either. Right. So. Well, and Tyler's just recently been remodeled, so Tyler might be a great place. Exactly. I have because this is science. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. And they're more likely to have been there, but I could send them to music spaces. To music to spaces to go to Hewitt, right? Mm -hmm. or, or go someplace else. Um, I'm wondering also if they can do a comparison if they if there's signage from before, maps from before they were reconstructed. Yeah. To what they're doing now and, and compare and contrast the signage, compare and contrast the layout. It happens on the, in, in different buildings, like the, yeah. how like one building is structured versus another in terms of how the wayfinding is and even wayfinding outside. Right. It's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I also want to do something related to architecture, but I need to see if I can find actual like an interesting architectural history of a specific building that I can actually find something 
Yeah, that's um, which I, I I don't I don't know have at the moment. Right. Well, one of the, in the the room one nineteen pilgrimage my students took, um, they actually talked to the building manager and got a map of the campus center hmm. so they could look up one nineteen because Barb was like I I don't even know if we have one nineteen. It turns out that they do. Hmm. Um, and so they, they, I still have the map. That's fine. And so they give you a map. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and map of the mm -hmm. construction site. But um, I wanted to address yeah. Elizabeth. Um, a food pilgrimage would be interesting to get students moving through campus. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Um, and seeing what kinds of food is available in different buildings, how they access it, where they go, who's there. Um, one thing I did when I first did the travel class that might be useful for you, Elizabeth, is I had. Um, I wanted students to visit a classroom, of a building that they don't normally go to, and just sit there and make observations mm -hmm. for like a half an hour or an hour in a journal about who's there, who's coming in, who's, who's leaving, what are they doing, where are they sitting, what are they, you know, how are they engaging with other people. So you might have a food pilgrimage uh, journal that they have to keep um, so that they can see and, and if they would go to a different place every week and they would visit the same places again to see differences in time and differences in days of the week and differences in terms of the differences between people that are like scarfing down versus right. like actually just like sitting and eating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So one of the um what I did there was I had um students visit a different building and, and they said they had to present as if they were an anthropologist, like a cultural anthropologist doing a presentation about the people in the building and what they learned about the building. So one student, um, one group of students actually decided to go to Shinamu and they created a whole new group of people called Shinamunis. Shinamunis? Shinamunis. And so he described it almost as if he was describing like a foreign culture or aliens. And it was really, really interesting. Shinamunis do this, Shinamunis do that. And they're both, you know, they're different genders and global people. And it was great. Ooh, it was really, really nice. I wanted to do something similar to that too, like in preparation for travel that's like using the five senses, because that's I want them to do that in yep. Prague. But and that's what Candace recommended. So you might yeah. talk to her about uh, ways for students to engage their senses, because what she wanted them to do, which I thought was great, was to listen to the lake as it sort of comes in, touch the ground, touch the grass. Um, um, smell the air, you know, wherever mm -hmm. they're going, just so they can have more visceral response. Because they, the, the whole point of this is that they don't normally pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. when they go from class to class to class. They don't care. They're just on a mission. And this way they have to take their time to, to really take it in. Any, um, any other questions? I originally thought of doing stuff that was like more off in the city of SVU because there's some value in that, but I, yep. like, some of what you're talking about is um, making me rethink that a little bit, that it's actually a little more convenient to do it on campus, but there's actually yep. many places on campus where they may feel like they're an outsider. Yes, um, exactly. And they have to, they have to navigate it a little bit more, yeah. Going, I wanted to originally go off campus, but trying to find transportation with no money and try and find good time when we all had time, which was next to impossible with honor students because they were so tremendously busy. Um, so I flipped it to do it on campus, and I think it worked really well, actually. So you, 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 you can do it. Yeah. What you, can. Um, you might actually think about giving them a map of the campus the way it originally was, like in the 1800s. And if maybe there's something to be learned from seeing the way it was then to Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Elizabeth, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun.